We are driving through southern Somalia, the heart of the drought-affected area. 20 years ago, I left Somalia on foot, walking for days to flee violence and hunger. Now I'm here to talk to families escaping this new crisis. Mukhtar Rabi, the village elder, showed me where he used to water hundreds of cattle. People from this village have died from starvation. The situation is unbearable. Everywhere I look, the drought has destroyed life. Thousands of animals have starved to death. Amongst the bones, their last meal is now visible. Plastic bags were all they could find to eat. In the nearby village, most people have packed up and left. But I found Halima Abdi, a widow, sheltering from the sun. Last year I had 500 goats, 60 cows and 50 camels. Now they're all gone. I have nothing. But it's not just her animals she lost to the drought. She took me to see the head of the family, her eldest son. Powerless to prevent the collapse of their livelihood, Abdi has had a mental breakdown. He is now paralyzed with depression. The village children are too young to understand the threat of famine, but their grandmothers warned again and again the situation was becoming desperate. Harira Adan told me she had only just realized that I wasn't an aid worker bringing her food. Those who are able to go in search of food do. Further along the road, I met a large group of people striding across the desert bush, piled high with belongings. I asked them where they were heading. There's lots of fighting and hunger in Somalia. We're going to Dadaab, where we hope to be safe, find food, education and medicine for our children. I decided to walk with the Ibrahim family and hear more about their desperate decision to leave Somalia and head towards the Dab in Kenya, the world's largest refugee camp. Abdi told me the family is from Dinsor, the epicenter of the famine. It's a 300-mile journey from his hometown to the Dab. We've been walking for 15 days. This is our 16th. We'll keep on going till we reach the Dab. After 10 hours of walking, the Ibrahim family sets up camp in the open. They prepare to cook small amounts of food donated along the route. It's time to rest for tomorrow's long walk. We're on the road again. Somalia's famine has particularly hurt the youngest. But Abdi's children tease me for not keeping up with them as they run barefooted. Fatuma gets a thorn in her foot, but they don't stop for long. As they approach Kenya's border town, everyone is in need of fresh water supplies. It is day 17 for them, and day 2 for me. I'm already struggling, but they want to continue. For them, this is the long walk for a better life. We stumble across a group of UN and other aid workers. They're scouting the border area for a new transit camp to process the thousands of families fleeing the drought. They ask Abdi's group what they need and promise to help. Setting herself down in the shade, Hawa Osman is hopeful someone can drive them the final miles to the dab. She's desperate not to walk anymore. From under her hijab, she reveals the youngest member of the group. Hassan was only 15 days old when their long trek began. We were hoping they would help us with transport to Dadaab, but they haven't. Five hours later, Abdi decides the wait for help will be too long. After walking for more than two weeks, they are clearly exhausted. And the final destination, Dadaab, is only 50 miles away from here. But the road ahead is dangerous. There are bandits who regularly attack and loot the refugees. I wish them a safe and speedy journey. I heard the following day everyone made it safely to the camp. Abdi and his family are just the latest of generations of Somalis driven out of their homeland by famine and war.
This is by Dabo, stronghold of the Islamist Al-Shabaab group, whose flag flies over most of drought-hit southern Somalia. Al-Shabaab say they are the legitimate authority of Somalia, but America and Britain accuse Al-Shabaab of being a terrorist organization. Caught in the middle, these Somalis fleeing the worst drought in 60 years. The old presidential palace has become a refugee camp that is swelling by the day. I am the first journalist to be allowed full access to these communities living under the control of Al-Shabaab since the famine was declared. I had heard stories of widespread desperation and hunger, especially amongst the children. But nothing prepared me for the shocking scenes once I entered the main hospital. When Khadija arrived here a week ago, she was in a terrible condition. She's gaining weight, but her mother Muhubba is worried she might still lose her. The UN says nearly 4 million Somalis are in danger of starvation, the majority of them children. Muhammad Janayo is in grave danger. His tiny body shows signs of acute malnutrition and dehydration. His big brother Mahmoud is there to comfort him. But years of not enough food has left him too, looking much younger than he is. Mahmoud is 16. My parents are out in the camp looking for food with my four other brothers and sisters, he tells me. It's the same story next door. Hamdi tells me she has been left to look after her sister, Safiya. Although we've saved many lives, four, five or six children die and are buried every day. Some die of diarrhea, others lack of food. The hospital had six rooms, full of mothers desperately trying to keep their children alive. With some help from the outside world, these doctors are able to save lives. But here in southern Somalia, natural disaster has been turned into famine by arguments over access. Many international aid agencies, including the World Food Programme, have pulled out of Al-Shabaab areas, accusing the group of extortion and intimidation. This is one of the most dangerous places in the world for aid workers to operate. This is the WFP compound in Marka. It was the second largest base in southern Somalia. By this time of the year, it would have been very, very busy, but it's completely empty because they were kicked out of this area by Al-Shabaab. Now the international donors are unwilling to rush money back into the area, fearing it will end up in the hands of militants linked to Al-Qaeda. In his first television interview with the Western media, I asked the Al-Shabaab spokesman if his group was deliberately obstructing the aid effort. There is a drought, but it's not reached a famine. The famine has been averted due to support and aid from business and Somali communities. He dismissed reports that Al-Shabaab have demanded taxes from aid agencies as just propaganda. We've only refused those who were doing more harm than good, and those agencies with political agendas. We have allowed access to all other charities. And as the authority, it is Al-Shabaab which decides who is allowed in. The group monitors throughout every process of the aid relief operation. Islamic Relief is one of the international agencies who have been able to bring supplies into the worst affected zone. With their own staff on the ground, they say they are confident none of their supplies are being diverted or taxed. I joined them on the first day as they distributed rations to 5,000 families in Baidabo. We really need sometimes to put politics aside and we are in a humanitarian emergency. We really need to save lives. When I come to an, uh, Baidawa and I find people really in need of aid and I am not able to access funds and support basically because somebody is fearing that funds are going to access Al-Shabaab, I think it's not humanistic, it's not, uh, it's not very noble. I wanted to travel to the second famine hit region in southern Somalia to see if the situation was any better. K-50 camp run by Al-Shabaab is packed with refugees displaced by the drought in Lower Shabele. 
as in most of Somalia, Al-Shabaab are the local authority and all aid agencies must cooperate with them in order to operate. However, aid organizations are adamant they themselves maintain control of the distribution. So some international aid is now crossing the front line to the famine zone, but there still can't be a mass UN presence on the ground. New arrivals camp amongst the plastic pallets while they wait to be registered and provided with tents. Amina and Hawa arrived yesterday from Toro Tori, which is about six miles from here. They said they have lost everything they had and they had to leave their homes. A makeshift clinic is run by two volunteer doctors and their medical students. They say they are seeing an alarming rise in cholera-like cases. Irgi Okuso is in emergency treatment on the floor. Months of poor nutrition have left her body weak against disease. The medical students is, uh, they are trying to get the IV uh, for, for rehydration, actually. So uh, we are doing our best. In an attempt to avoid the spread of disease and overcrowding in the camp, Al-Shabaab organizers are trying to encourage refugees to go back home. They'll give anyone returning extra rations and a lift to their village. Some refugees who have fled Al-Shabaab areas have accused the group of controlling their movements. The families here told me they volunteered to return home as they thought conditions would be better there. The Al-Shabaab man in charge of the refugee program in Lower Shabela region said he's pleased over a thousand families have taken up the offer. If the people become accustomed to and wait for handouts, they'll become idle and not want to work. We encourage the people to become self-confident and productive. In southern Somalia, where so many are barely surviving, the aid is trickling in. But it's only trickling in with the cooperation of Al-Shabaab. Aid organizations recognize it's impossible for them to operate without the group's help. Since the famine was declared, the Islamists have repeatedly been accused of hampering the relief effort. But during the short period I was there, I did not see any malpractice or corruption. In fact, many of the aid workers told me they actually appreciated Al-Shabaab's assistance. To put a stop to the disaster, these people need a whole-scale rescue effort. While the argument over access goes on, the long wait will continue. Jamal Osman, Channel 4 News, Southern Somalia.